रथेरथम यथ प्रतिवेता ना प्रतिवेत चाटमणि अद्विज्यार आत्मनो मायम यथा भासो यथा तमः ओ ब्रह्मा whatever appears to be of any value if it is without relation to me has no reality know it as my illusory energy that reflection which appears to be in darkness in this verse from the second canto of shrimad bhagavatam lord shri krishna is describing the most essential knowledge of the difference between reality and illusion he is explaining that whatever appears to have any value if it is not seen in relationship to me it is an illusion it has no reality aham sarvasya prabhava mat sarvam prabhatate iti matva bhajante mam buddha bhava samanta krishna is the source of everything that exists nothing can possibly be separated from krishna he is the creator he is the maintainer he is the annihilator of everything within the cosmic manifestation as the paramatma he is present in and between every atom and he is within the heart of every living being krishna is intrinsically present everywhere in and everything through his divine energy everything is his property nothing can exist separate from krishna any more than a sun ray can exist separate from the sun parashya shaktir vidai vasruyate the lord manifests himself through his infinite diversified energies primarily there are two energies the energy of yoga maya and the energy of maha maya yoga means to unite whatever is perceived within this world as the property of krishna and utilized in his service by taking anything or any conception and reuniting it with krishna through seva through bhakti that is called the yoga maya energy that energy which unites us in love with god but any conception any perception or any activity which which is to engage without reference to krishna anything of this world that is called mahamaya 
and the jivatma, the spirit soul, is eternally given the freedom, the independent will, to either utilize our God-given energy to reunite with Krishna or to divert away from Krishna. And when we choose by our own sweet will to act apart from the desire and interest of Krishna, we fall under the illusion that we are this material body and therefore we are subject to terrible, terrible anxiety, suffering, and ultimately death. People often ask, if God is perfect, why did he give us this independence? Why did he give us a free will by which if we misuse, we have to suffer? If he loves us, if a father and mother love their infant child, will they give it a knife to hold in its hand at the risk that it may stab itself to death? In the same way, God is our loving Father. Why has he given us this free will by which misusing causes us so much suffering and death. The Shastras explain that Krishna gives free will because if he did not, we could not enjoy the supreme ecstasy of, of loving exchange with the Lord. God has created everything for the purpose of bringing us ecstatic love and pleasure. He has created these eyes to see the beauty of himself everywhere in and everything. But if we look at the ugly and the terrible and the ignorant manifestations of this world, then this eye is the cause of great suffering. But if we did not have the eye, we could not see the beauty of God. Similarly, God has given us ears. The specific purpose he has given us these ears is to hear his divine glories and taste the ultimate sweetness of love. But if we choose to hear the gramya kata, the mundane subjects of this world, if we hear, choose to hear the gossips, the rumors, and the sound vibrations of Tamaguna and Rajaguna, then we cause our own suffering. So the fact that the eyes and the ears are making the wrong choice, does that mean God should deprive us of eyes and ears? In the same way, because we are making the mistake of misdirecting our free will, should God take away our free will? If he did, we would become like stone. We would become like a machine. At our temple, one of our devotees, Sri Galim, he's working day and night with a computer. Computer is a very sophisticated machine and he's writing a book of Sanskrit slokas in glorification of Krishna. And day and night this computer is manifesting on its screen 
these wonderful slokas from the Bhagavat, from the Chaitanya Charitamrita, from the Bhagavad Gita. And the computer even says, Jai Shri Radhe. And Sri Galim has programmed it to say Jai Shri Radhe. And he has programmed all the slokas glorifying Krishna. And the computer is constantly reciting all of these slokas and manifesting themselves. But because the computer has no free will, it is simply acting according to the programming of the operator. There's no love. There is no loving exchange between Sri Galim and the computer. Why? Because there's no free will. So if God created us with no free will to love him, we would love him like a computer. Which means we would not love him at all. We may chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. We may bow our heads. We may cook food for him. But these days with modern technology, they have created robots to could do, could do all of those things. But there's no pleasure. There's no ecstasy. There's no sweetness. Therefore, God has given us free will out of his causeless mercy so that we could taste the ecstasy of divine love in exchange with him. And when we utilize our free will for that purpose, of serving Bhagwan, then we enter into the abode of Yoga Maya. But when we misuse that free will for our own sense gratification, to see anything without relationship to Krishna, then we suffer. Some little pleasure, but then lots of suffering. That is material existence. Ye yatha mam prabhadyante tham sthatai vabhajam yaham mama vart manu vartante manusya parata saradasha Krishna reveals himself as we approach him. This Mahamaya energy has two aspects. The throwing potency and the covering potency. For those who choose to try to enjoy separate from Krishna, Krishna throws us into the whole experience of illusion. And once we're in that illusion, he perpetually covers us so that we cannot see the truth that is right before our eyes. The fact is that the truth, Krishna, is everywhere. Naham prakashya saravasya yoga maya samavrata mudho yam navajanati lokamam ajamavyayam But because we don't want to surrender to Krishna, Krishna covers the vision of himself from our eyes so that we can live in this fool's paradise, thinking that we are independent of the Lord. Krishna gives everyone the opportunity to exchange love with him. When Krishna was in Vrindavan, we read in Bhagavatam how much he loved the cows and the calves. When he was a young child, Nanda Maharaj gave him charge of the calves. Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahmanya Hitayacha. And he would spend 
throughout the entire day protecting these calves, just giving pleasure to these calves. He would do anything for them. In fact, he loved the cows and calves so much that when Indra sent torrents of rain to Vrindavan to destroy everything, <coughs> the first thing the Brijabhasis did when they approached Krishna is they said that these rains will cause pain and suffering to the cows and calves. So please save us. He knew how dear the cows were to him. In fact, when Indra learned his lesson, when he wanted to apologize to Krishna, first he approached the Surabi cow, knowing that if the cow approaches Krishna first, then Krishna may pay attention to Indra and give forgiveness. Krishna would spend his day with his little stick, with his buffalo horn, with his flute, and he would just go farther and farther into the pastures to find the greenest, freshest, nicest grass so that the calves would be satisfied. And he would go to the clearest, most delicious waters of the lakes in the river Jamuna just to satisfy the calves by providing them fresh water to drink. And he would blow his buffalo horn and play upon his flute and dance for the pleasure of these little calves. Such love. But there was one particular calf that appeared with him. He was actually a demon sent by Kamsa, Vatsashura. And he assumed the form of a calf, which was identical to all the other calves. And he entered Krishna's herd, which means he had all the facilities to enjoy the highest and sweetest loving exchanges with Krishna as all the other calves. He had the form, the body, and the opportunity for the ultimate ecstatic love and the most confidential relationship with God. But by his free will, instead of wanting to love Krishna and to serve Krishna and to receive his love, he wanted to kill Krishna. He wanted to destroy all the cowherd boys. Just see. There was no difference between Vatsasura and all the other calves except the free will. And Krishna responds according to how you approach him. The other calves were in the ecstasy of love with Krishna. And Vatsasura, Krishna grabbed him by the hind legs and threw him to the ground and killed him violently. Adiva! 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 When Krishna kills, it is the most wonderful, beautiful thing. Because when Krishna kills, he liberates that living being. Similarly, the cowherd boys, how Krishna loved the gopas. They would come every morning early to Nanda Bhavan, and they would be waiting outside, dressed very nicely for the pleasure of Krishna. And Jishodamai, she would wake Krishna 
with beautiful songs. She would give him bath. She would decorate him with nice clothes, with his peacock feather, and with nice garlands and jewelry. And then she would send Krishna and the gopas. They would meet him and they would start playing their flutes and blowing their horns and dancing together. And they would go out with their calves. And they would dance. And Krishna, how he loved the gopas. Sometimes they would play nice games. They would play with balls, with fruits. And they would, uh, they would throw at one another. Sometimes one gopa would steal another gopa's lunchbox and throw it to another. And throw it to another. And Krishna would enjoy seeing this fun. And sometimes all the gopas, they would have races. Who could touch Krishna first? And sometimes, just for their pleasure, Krishna would imitate animals. He would move his neck like a peacock and make them laugh. And sometimes, together, they would imitate monkeys in the trees. And they would imitate frogs and jump into the water. Sometimes they would wrestle together. And Krishna would allow the gopa to win. Sridhama was very famous in Vrindavan because he was able to defeat Krishna in wrestling. How is it that anyone can defeat Krishna in wrestling? Because Krishna takes pleasure in giving pleasure to his devotees. Krishna is the supreme master of all masters. He's the all-powerful personality of Godhead. Do you think Krishna takes pleasure in defeating one of his infinitesimal parts and parcels? Does a father take pleasure in defeating his son in wrestling? The father takes pleasure in allowing the son to defeat him. Similarly, Krishna takes great pleasure in allowing his gopas to defeat him in wrestling matches. But one time, one asura appeared exactly in the form of a gopa. His name was Pralambasura. In that form, he had every opportunity to wrestle with Krishna and defeat him in love. He had every opportunity to enjoy these eternal, wonderful pastimes. But he came not with the free will to please Krishna and to serve Krishna, but he came to kill Krishna and Balaram. And they were playing a nice game and all the other gopas were enjoying the sweetness of Prema. But he was simply suffering the ambition of envy. In the same way, this whole world is the manifestation of Krishna's Leela. If we simply have the consciousness of using our free will for Krishna's pleasure, then we can enjoy the nectarine Leela of the Lord. But if we are envious, if we have separate interest in the Lord, we become like Pralamba Sura. He stole Balaram away, took him deeper and deeper and deeper into the forest to kill him. And ultimately Balaram, with his strong fist, smashed him in the head, cracked his head open, and he fell to the ground dead. Sri Dhamma is defeating Krishna in wrestling and Pralambasura 
has his head cracked open, violently, painfully killed. And they're both cowherd boys. In this way, Krishna gives everyone free will. If we simply utilize our free will to search for him, to please him, to serve him, to remember him, then we can enter into the lila of love. But if we misuse our free will to enjoy anything separate from him, we have to suffer the pains of birth and death. Guru Maharaj used to say that there is one energy of God, but according to our consciousness, that energy appears different. The difference between Yoga Maya and Maha Maya is simply our perception. Just like this electrical current. When it goes into a refrigerator, it creates a cooling effect. When it enters into a stove, it produces heat. Is electricity hot or cold? When it goes into the stove, it's hot, and when it goes into the air conditioner, it's cool. Similarly, the energy of God is the life force that maintains and preserves everything within existence. When that energy is perceived by the consciousness that is influenced by envy, it creates illusion. But when that same divine energy of God is perceived in a heart that wants to serve, it is perceived as truth. It liberates us. It is said in the Brahma Sutra, Atato Brahma Jigyasa, that now that you have attained this rare human form of life, you should inquire into what is Brahman, what is the absolute truth. And what is the definition of the absolute truth in Brahma Sutra? Janma Yashayataha. Him from whom everything emanates. This is a preliminary understanding of spiritual life. The most basic principle of spirituality. But the soul is looking for something more than the origin of everything. The soul is such an ananda by nature. The soul is looking for ras, madhurya ras, looking for pleasurable loving exchange. Therefore, we are not satisfied with simply inquiring into what is the origin of everything that exists. Our inquiry is who is Krishna? Because Krishna is Rasaraj. He is the reservoir of all pleasure. And until the spirit soul comes to the platform of approaching Krishna with humility and devotion, to understand more and more and more about Krishna. To enter more and more in the service of Krishna. We cannot experience that pleasure that we are eternally longing for. At one time, when our Gurudev, Srila Prabhupada, brought this 
movement of Lord Sri Chaitanya, his movement of Srimad Bhagavatam to the Western world, he named it the Krishna Consciousness Movement. And some of his disciples, they suggested that people do not know who is Krishna. It will be more understandable if we name it the God Consciousness Movement. Because after all, Krishna is God. And Srila Prabhupada said, no, we will not do this. Because the idea of God is the origin of everything, the creator of all that exists. That is an intellectual understanding. But in order to satisfy the heart's desires, we must seek not God, but Krishna. Krishna is the sweetest, highest understanding of God. Because by searching for Krishna and only Krishna, Anandam Bhurivaradhanam Pradivaram Punam Nitashvadanam, can our hearts find that reservoir of pleasure it is always longing for. The gopis, they were always searching for Krishna. There is a holy place near Govardhan called Chandrasrovar. Close to that place, the gopis were looking for Krishna. He was hiding from them. They were searching and searching and searching. And when Krishna saw that they were about to find him, he manifested his form as Narayan. Narayan is God. With his four arms holding the kank and the chakra and the gada and the lotus flower. And when the gopis saw the majestic supreme form of Narayan, who is the creator, the maintainer, and the destroyer of everything, They bowed down with great respect. And they spoke to him by inquiring, Have you seen Krishna? They knew Narayan was God, but they could not enjoy. And they they could not be enjoyed in that sweetness of Ras with Narayan. Only Krishna exchanges that love. So we all offer all respects to God in all forms. But our heart's desire is always longing for the ras, the madhurya ras, the sweet love that Krishna is eternally offering all living beings. So Guru Maharaj said, we will name it Krishna Consciousness. Because this movement is for those who are constantly seeking to be conscious of Krishna. There is no doubt that God is one. The Brahma Samhita explains, that Lord Nirsinghadev, Lord Bhamanadev, Lord Sri Ramchandra, Lord Narayan, even the Devatas, Lord Shankar, Buddha, Kalki, they are all the one supreme person. And therefore we accept the unity of all religions. Allah, Jehovah, Yahweh, all of the great spiritual systems throughout history, throughout the world, are describing the one God of all living beings. That one personality, who by his inconceivable potency manifests himself in so many wonderful ways just to attract our minds and our hearts 
and to re-establish the principles of religion. The Bhagavatam explaining all these various incarnations of the Lord ends the description by explaining Krishna Stu Bhagavan Swayam that the origin of all manifestations of the one absolute truth is Krishna. And for those who want to enter into this relationship of divine love, they fix their mind in Krishna. To always search for Krishna in everything, everywhere, that is the path of perfection. Maharaj Parikshit, when he was a little child in the womb of his mother, Ashwatthama threw the uh, Brahmastra to kill him. At that time, Krishna appeared and saved him. He had that glimpse of Krishna. And after he came out of the womb, wherever he went, he was simply looking for Krishna. Whatever we seek in our life, we will find. Everywhere we look, whether it be at a tree, or the grass, or the floor, or the wall, or a human being, or an animal, if we are looking for Krishna in that person, or in that thing, Krishna will reveal himself. But if we are looking for anything else, all we will see is the dead matter. How to see Krishna in everything? It's actually quite simple. Once we asked our Guru Maharaj, how are we supposed to see Krishna in dead matter? Guru Maharaj said, If I leave this room and you see my spectacles on this table, what will you think of when you see these spectacles? We said, We will think that this is Guru Dev's spectacles. He said, so in this way, you are seeing me in the spectacles by remembering the spectacles relationship with me. In the same thing, everything is the energy of the Lord. Everything is the property of the Lord. And everything is meant for the service of Krishna. If I see that this floor, it is Krishna's floor. It is meant to dance on for Krishna. When I see this fan, this is Krishna's energy. This is meant for Krishna's service. We are seeing Krishna in that thing. Therefore, we are no longer seeing dead matter anywhere. We are seeing Krishna everywhere. This is the science of bhakti. And if we remember Krishna, we are never separated from Krishna. The difference between union with Krishna and separation from Krishna is simply whether we remember him or forget him. Therefore, Kapila Muni explains that of all the scriptures, of all the instructions, there are two that summarize all knowledge. To always remember Krishna, and never forget Krishna. When we remember Krishna, the uniting energy of Yoga Maya brings us closer to Krishna. When we forget Krishna, the Mahamaya potency covers us from the reality and the truth of Krishna's divine love, which is manifesting itself everywhere. How to always remember Krishna? That is the most important question in life. How to never forget Krishna? 
This is what the scriptures are teaching us. This is what all the great acharyas are teaching us. In this age of Kali Yuga, there is such a wonderful, simple formula to always remember Krishna. And that is to chant his holy name. By properly chanting the name of God, it fills our consciousness with such remembrance of Krishna that everything we see, everything we hear, everything we taste will simply bring us closer to Krishna. The foundation of the path of bhakti is to remember Krishna by chanting his holy name. And then everything we do all that we do, all that we eat, all that we offer and give away, all austerities, charities we may perform, it is all naturally done as an offering to Krishna if we are always remembering Krishna by chanting his holy name. Kalera dosani de raja nasti he kumahan guna. Kirtana deva krishna sya mukta sangha param brajet. In this age of Kali Yuga, there is one benediction which is present like a lotus flower in an ocean of faults. And what is that one benediction? That simply by remembering Krishna through chanting his name, we can all attain the supreme perfection of liberation. The transcendental sound vibration of Lord Sri Krishna's name reconnects our consciousness with the supreme truth. Liberates us from the illusory energy of the Lord. Krishna Surya Sam Moya Hoya Andaka Yahan Krishna Tahanahi Maya Radhikara. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explained that Krishna is like the sun and he's non different than his name. And Maya is like darkness. In the presence of the sun, <coughs> darkness cannot survive. Similarly, in the presence of the sincere chanting of Harinam, maya, ignorance, illusion, and death cannot survive. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram. So we must know that this chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra is not simply some sentimental process. This chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra is a sublime science based on the most profound, deep, and authoritative philosophy. And yet it is so simple that even a child can perfect its life by chanting and dancing and glorifying God's holy name. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Hare. So, do you want to be Vatsasura or do you want to be one of the Braja calves? Do you want to be a Gopa like Sri Dhamma, Subal, Stoka Krishna? Madhu Mangal, or do you want to be a Gopa like Pralamba Sura? That is your choice.
And if you choose to be Krishna's servant, simply chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram. Always remember him and simply live for his pleasure. Thank you very much.